Hello. Today I'm going to talk about uh, two uh, novels that I have very recently read. One is <coughs> Tana French's Witch Elm. Uh, this one I read uh, in the month of January, I think, and then Dan Simon's The Terror. This one I have just recently finished and have moved on to another book. Let's start with Dana French uh, is Witch Elm. Now, I, I'm in the habit of, of hunting books or looking for books to read and I look at internet forums and, and, and countdowns and authors' favorites and all that sort of thing. And very often I came across this title, uh, Tana French's Witch Elm. I came across it very often and it's then that I thought that I should read this, I should get a copy of this and should get to reading it. And then in last year's book fair, Kolkata book fair, I actually saw this, uh, at some shop, some shelf, and I quite liked the look of the book uh, as, I, as I first looked at it, the cover design and, and all. It seemed a quite, quite a thick book, which it is, it is uh, quite a thick book. It's, it's quite big as well. It, it stands tallest in the shelf in which it is at the moment residing. Um, but it, it's actually not that long a book because it, the pages, every page of the book is quite a thick page and the fronts are quite large with a lot of gaps at the margin. So it's not, not a very gruesome read and the pace of the book is fantastic. So the story is, uh, it's about a guy called Toby. Uh, Toby is not not a very successful uh, man at, at such. He works at an art gallery. Um, he, he gets involved with some immoral things, uh, not necessarily bad things, but really immoral things uh, at the gallery. And then one night when he is sleeping at his apartment, two guys invade his apartment to steal um, his TV, his Xbox, his camcorder and all other valuable kind of stuff. Uh, he wakes up mid-sleep and he confronts them and he gets badly beaten. He, he's, he's beaten from being in an inch of life and he is admitted to a hospital with severe dents uh, in every part of his body, his head most noticeably, uh, broken ribs and several other major uh, damages to his body and from this time on his memory is failing he cannot quite remember uh, everything so clearly about his past and he's recovering uh, back at his apartment but he can no longer uh, go to walk uh, he can he can really no longer do basic simple things without problem so he, he basically needs looking after, but he's such a such a kind of a proud um, young man. He doesn't want anybody to look after him. He would not go and stay with his mom and dad. Uh, you know, he probably would think that they'd be too passionate or he would be a burden on them or something. And his girlfriend, Malisha, he, she sometimes uh, comes down, uh, but he doesn't want her to stay with him uh, in his, his state, in his present state either. So he basically uh, lives alone uh, in his apartment trying to re reconfigure or refigure his, al uh, his life and, and uh, the way he can now again do simple things. And then one day he hears news that his uncle Hugo, uh, whom he remembers very, very fondly, is uh, dying. He's diagnosed with terminal cancer and he's living uh, at his country house, which uh, Toby and his two cousins, he's got, uh, he's got two cousins, uh, Suzanne and Leon, and they call it the Ivy House. It's a country house uh, where Hugo is presently living and alone, so they need somebody to look after Hugo, if not practically, uh, you know, change his clothes or something, at least to be there if he falls in the bathroom or down the stairs or something bad happens to him, he needs somebody to be there. So despite a lot of reluctance, Toby decides to go there and it is there that the that this, that this 
this major part of this novel unfolds. Um, his cousin Suzanne is married to a guy called Tom, and they have two kids, uh, a daughter and a son. And these nephews of Toby, one day while playing in the in the garden in the ivy house, the ivy house has a quite a big garden, lots of trees. They come uh, across a hole in a big tree, a witch elm uh, in the garden. Uh, Toby's nephew and niece comes across a hole and from there they dig out a skull, a human skull. And from there all hell breaks loose. Uh, they just modified that a human skull is found in their garden tree. Subsequently, the whole of the skeleton was found and then the investigation starts and you know, all of these things of who was this guy that was killed, who killed him, why is the, the skull in the witch elm and the body buried in the garden. The garden is completely excavated. It doesn't look the same as it was. And there, there are so many memories that Toby, Suzanne, Leon, and some of their other friends have of these of the, of that garden. They used to party as a teenager, and during the summer breaks and all. Uh, it's a it's a beautiful novel. It's very fast paced. It's it's not a brooding novel. It it just moves on page to page to page, and you keep turning uh, the pages, and you realize, oh, well, well I'm near the end, or. It's, it's it's right there and it keeps you guessing all the time you're always thinking who is this guy who killed him who hid him what was the plan uh, you move from this thought process to the next thought process in a matter of minutes and back to this thought process again it takes you in a complete complete ride it takes you in a complete ride and it, it's it's it delivers all the emotions you can you can think of. It's it's not just some um, thriller novel you pick up from somewhere, you read and you forget about it. This this thing delivers everything from love to envy to um, pain of thwarted ambition, you name it. It's it's all there. Uh, it's a it's a fantastic book. Right at the end, when you think everything is figured out, you know everything that there is to know something happens again before the book ends so i highly suggest you read this tana french's witch elm this will be a complete pleasure uh, reading the next novel i want to discuss is the terror by dan simons now this is this has a completely different setting than what was there in and the witch elm, the setting of uh, this is 1845 when two of Her Majesty's ships, HMS Erebus and HMS Terror, the name of which this novel is named after, presumably, set sail to find the Northwest Passage. It's, it's a passage that was not discovered back then, uh, for which the discovery science uh, of uh, Great Britain spent a lot of money and committed a lot of men to find the passage basically linked the Atlantic Sea to the Pacific Sea. So you could actually sail from uh, Europe and connect through the Northwest Passage and come all the way around the other side of North America. And um, as, we, as, as we all know that the, that the two ships set sail in uh, 1845 and they were never recovered the the two ships just vanished somewhere <coughs> they were last seen in 1845 at the baffin bay by the whalers but after that no one has seen those ships again till now there has been expeditions there has been um theories there has been people investigating this whole phenomenon but nobody could tell exactly what happened to the ships or could bring the ships back out maybe somewhere they had sank but these ships the two ships the hms erebus and hms terror just vanished trying to find the northwest pacific now dan simons takes this context this is not a historical no uh, a historical non-fiction so to speak so it's not dan simons's purpose to tell you what happened with the ships uh, his theory of it with objective uh, evidences to support it 
it is a novel and he just takes the setting and he weaves his fictional weaves uh, his, his fictional net around that and comes up with this uh, this is again a, a fascinating novel this is this is quite chunky it, it's um, it, it's it will take a little bit of time to go through it, but it's again very fast paced. It is not slow, it's not brooding, it's not doodling or something. It, everything, every time there's something or something else happening, Dan Simons creates a very unique um, atmosphere of foreboding. So you almost feel that you are in somewhere in those two ships, in those two ships. Uh, Erebus and Terror, and you feel very invested with the fate of the crews as to what will happen to them. So where will they go from there? They're stuck in, in, in thick ice, in pack ice. There's no lead, no open water anywhere. So where will they go from here as year after year after year passes and their reserves and supplies of food and other things deteriorate? It appears that the, the, the canned food that they carried has some sort of deficiency or some sort of poison there is scurvy that is rampant now in the ships and, and you really start to think well what will happen to all these people one after the other starts to perish and there is ever dwindling number of crewmen left but this is fantastic um, drama it also lays bare that part of human psyche where a human being is willing to do everything uh, to just to stay alive, just to tend to his basic necessities of food or clothing and what have you. But then this is Dan Simmons. This is this this just, just cannot be just any other historical fiction. This is Dan Simmons. So of course there is a supernatural element to it. The supernatural element Dan Simmons supplies in the terror comes from Eskimo folklore or Eskimo mythology, demonology, whatever you want to call it. Um, the, the monster that is here, uh, yes, there is a monster in this book. The monster is called Tunbak. Uh, Tunbak is taken from Eskimo um, folklore and right at the end of the book, uh, where almost the fate of all the crew members uh, is almost being told by Dan Simons, you understand that it's all bleak and doom and it's almost near the end. Then Dan Simons starts to sort of expound the Eskimo folklore, uh, the Eskimo mythology on which he has based his demon in order to try to explain to the readers from where did he get this, what are the origins of this Thunbach that he's depicted so very vividly, so very well in this novel. It's a little bit drawn out, that part of the novel, and at times reading that part, you feel um, as if, well, it could have been done a little shorter. But it, it, again, it's Dan Simons's way of telling you from where he has got this character and what are the circumstances, what are the prevailing norms of the Eskimos that he wants you to understand and he wants you to understand within the context of that ice, of all that ice that, that is there. <clears throat> and now it's, it's also being made a television series, The Terror, it's available in Amazon Prime. And I've watched that series once, uh, I think maybe a year, year and a half, two years back, but back then I did not read the novel. But now that I have read the novel, I will I will watch the series again, um, and I'll do a separate video uh, discussing the differences and the convergences among the the two, the printed version and the silver screen version. After I have finished watching the the whole of the series, there's a very famous um, quote from the terror that I uh, keep keep remembering and keep finding. And new meanings to it's when uh, somebody said look this place wants us dead on uh, that the whole ice and the the temperature and the 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 climate the topography you think he's saying that because it's such a hostile place that there is there's no food there there's no warmth there 
it's almost all the time night, there's no, no, uh, no real sun there. So when, some, when someone is saying that this place wants us dead, you're thinking that, okay, the, the, the elements are so hostile, that's why he says this. But after you have finished reading the novel, you realize that there is actually another dimension to it, that there is actually something that actively wants all the crew members dead. And that's the supernatural element of the terror. So again, I suggest that you read this, Dance of Monsters Terror. It's a, it's, a, it's a fantastic book. It may not be everybody's cup of tea. Um, you, you probably should not take it too seriously as, as a historic fact. But you should read this. This is, this is so much fun reading. And you really feel you're transported back to, to that time in those two ships. Uh, it's complete. It's it's complete joy to read um, this one. So as I said, I'll make a separate video about the series, uh, the terror and the book, and I'll compare the two. Till then, I hope you read something very really good, and stay well. Bye bye.